<laughs> Good evening, everyone. So my name is Emma Guest Gonzalez. I'm the president of GANIC. I'm really happy to be here. I love, love, love in-person meetings. So seeing everybody every time is a joy. It really is. So thank you all for coming out on a kind of drizzly um, evening. Hopefully it'll be dry when we leave and nobody will get too, too soaked. How are we doing with sound on? Everybody's good? I hope so, because I'm doing my best. All right. So um, I hope you all picked up the agenda. Everyone could take a look, see at the agenda, and let me know if there's anything to add, if there's any new business to add. I do. Okay. Bob? Huh? There's a change to the agenda. We do have a speaker from the center, Michael Graham, who is the information and referral manager. Okay, so Michael Graham, the information and referral manager from the center, will be our host. Welcome, I'll pull him up in just a few minutes. Anything else? John, you had your hand up. Anyone else had something? No, that was it. Okay, anyone else have anything to add? I just want to add one. Um, um, IT will be giving a report. That wasn't on the... It's just a really super short report, so IT will be speaking as well. Okay, so if there's nothing else to add, no business, new business to add, um, then all in favor of approving the agenda as is, just raise your hand. All good. All right, cool. So the agenda is approved. So um, I'd like to welcome Michael Graham, who I we just mentioned, who will be our um, who will give us a welcome from the center. So Michael, if you want to come on up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Thank you to my Zoom folks. Oh, I'm going to position myself accordingly. You are awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, so, as has been mentioned, my name is Michael. I'm the information and referral manager here at the center. Um, so, uh, that mostly means that I supervise the front desk team. When you walk in, you'll see one, two, or three people sat behind that desk. I might be one of them, or I will be their supervisor. Um, so, if you see me, come say hi. Um, I've been a staff member here uh, for about four and a half years now. Um, and before that, I was a volunteer in our archive um, for about six years before that. So um, center history is what brought me here. And um, I guess I'm important as I don't, I'm sure I don't have to explain to you all. Um, I know a lot of us went on a tour earlier, so I don't want to go, yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. Across the town, that's right. right. Um, I can, I have, where to even begin about things to say about the center. The building that you're standing in was founded, or was built in uh, 1869, about 150 years old. Um, and it was a public school for the first few decades of its existence. Uh, lived a great life for a few decades and then uh, conditions have deteriorated after a while. In 1921, the New York City Department of Education did a survey of all the schools just to see what the conditions were. And they found that um, sending your child to the public school here was tantamount to an act of criminal negligence. Um, so the school was shut down shortly afterwards. Um, uh, it was uh, resurrected not long after that. It's a food and maritime trade safe school. Um, which was housed here for a few decades as well. And it's funny to still get people at the front desk um, who would be like, I, I was a member of the 1964 class of the Food and Maritime Trade Trade School, and I took butcher class across the garden and pastry class on the second floor. Um, which is always a delay. The past is never really past. I guess that's what they say. Not even past. Um, and then we moved in in 1983, um, and we've been rocking and rolling ever since. Um, we, uh, there have been a few kind of capital campaign renovations. There was a major one that happened 1998 to 2001, where we were so essential we said, we've got to renovation. We picked up our operations, moved over to Little West 12th Street and lived there for a few years um, so we could beautify the space. Um, and then a second one, um, I don't know if you folks have been here before, but a lot of folks will remember this one. It's like 2012 to 2014, um, was another, uh, major renovation and happens to the space, which uh, brings us to the building that you're standing in today. Um, and in 2019, we were made uh, a New York City official uh, landmark. So it's very exciting. Exciting time for us. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, a lot of important groups have lived at the center or were founded at the center um, that have contributed to the greater kind of landscape of 
New York City's LGBT uh, the makeup. Um, ACT UP was maybe the most notable one. That's the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Um, and uh, was founded in March of, I can go into, that was founded kind of as a, like as a, um, as an unlucky, uh, like a lucky coincidence, I guess, for us, where um, there's a uh, lecture series that has been going on called Second Tuesday, um, which happens every, as you might guess, second Tuesday of the month, um, where they invite a, like a noted cultural uh, speaker or politician or um, notable person to come speak and give a lecture while we have a conversation. Um, and Nora Ephron was supposed to, uh, she's based in Seattle and uh, born here in Mill Valley, was supposed to come and be the um, contributor in March of 1987. And she fell ill a few days beforehand. And so they're scrambling to find someone, scrambling to find someone. And they uh, um, asked Larry Kramer, you know, who was a noted uh, playwright and activist, British lesbian and cultural writer, um, to come and uh, which is a big great podcast episode. So if you want to know more, come find me afterwards. But uh, one of the employees, his name is Rob Woodworth, who was here for like 30 years, tells this really great story about being up in his third floor office at the time, um, where Larry gives this powerful, motivating speech. Um, and Obama comes coming, uh, Rob, Larry's got to really riled up on the first floor. Can we meet again next week? And then uh, find, time, uh, find time on the calendar for next week. Um, and then they have been meeting here on Monday nights ever since. Um, obviously, COVID notwithstanding, they've been doing that. But uh, so yeah, act up. Um, Town and Lord is another. It's like a large um, LGBT specific healthcare organization. They were the community healthcare project for Lucia in the 80s. Um, they moved out in 1997, 98. Um, Sage um, services, services and advocacy for has been GLBT elders. Um, lived here for a long time. Uh, there are more I could go on, but um, a lot of uh, very important work that's happened in these very, very halls. Um, and then another notable uh, moment in our history was our center show, um, which happened in 1989 um, to, to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Stonewall Riot. Um, a lot of the artwork that you're seeing in the hallways is a result of that, um, including the Keith Haring bathroom on the second floor. If you have not seen it, it's in 205, yes. Um, the Center Show, they um, commissioned, I want to say like somewhere in the area of like 45 or so um, artists. And they said, pick a space in the building and create something there. Um, so most of them were collages and paintings. Um, there was one, I guess it was a temporary exhibit initially, so uh, someone, I guess, turned one of the bathrooms into like a disco room with like a disco ball when Donna Summer playing on repeat all day. Um, and it was such a big hit that they, uh, they, they made an effort to preserve a lot of the works, which is what you're seeing when you walk through our hall. Uh, and then, yeah, okay, that's a notable moment in Central history. And then, uh, Today, we have uh, a really robust uh, substance use recovery program, um, which was the first uh, LGBT-specific substance use recovery program in New York State, founded in 1987. Um, and it's still going very strong today, doing great work. Um, we have a big mental health counseling program, uh, which provides uh, counsel free counseling for folks who are under, uh, uninsured and underinsured. Um, there's a lot of community support work where we do case management, um, HIV services, uh, health care insurance enrollment. Um, we have a big, big youth program which uh, provides uh, leadership opportunities, uh, substance use support, um, social environment for young people ages 13 to 21. Um, as well as rooms like this, which we rent out to all different kinds of groups. Um, we have a lot of self set groups. We have a lot of political groups. We have social groups. We have religious groups. And they will all just kind of update here on a weekly basis, monthly basis, annual basis. Um, and we are happy to also update home for all of them. So that's my quick spiel. Questions? Oh, gosh. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for that informative history. Uh, could we just give a shout out 
to the Sam who gave the BAM tour. Oh, I, didn't, I didn't attend it, but we really appreciate it. Uh, what, could, I, um, could you repeat her full name? Yes, Sam Kiley. Uh, it's a hyphenated last name. Kiley, K-I-L-E-Y, LaRoche, L-A-R-O-T-H-E. Sam Kiley LaRoche. Yeah, love him. Okay. Yeah, we had a question. Yeah. So, uh, did your organization have any events this month, or were you guys uh, promoting any of like the or maybe like posters or what's going on? Woo! Nothing. It's just June. It's just five months. Yeah. Yeah. The big one is our garden party, which happens, um, it used to happen in our garden and has expanded so large that it now happens on a pier um, in the, over in the Hudson and in the town west. Um, so that's our like official pride uh, event. We also have, we have like kind of a presence at all the, all the different boroughs have a pride and we have like tabling or some type of presence at all of those. Um, as well as a big presence in the parade with a big float and shirts and flag <laughs> and whatnot. Um, we have our second Tuesday coming up next week, which I'm uh, I'm forgetting the specifics on, but I can get you those if I'm uh, What's that? The date is leading me right now, but I want to want to say it. It's at the end of the month. You can get to if you go to gaycenter.org, that'll have the information on it. But I want to say it's probably uh, sometime during the last week of the month. Leading up to yeah. Do you have do you know or have a working relationship with uh, AIDS activist Tom McKenna, long term survivor? Oh, I, the name sounds familiar, but I don't. I'm not, I don't off the top of my head. So. I, just, I asked him. He won the Lifetime Achievement Award with our organization. Uh, you know, for his AIDS activism, mm -hmm. and, and we talked a lot about you know long term survivors being you know sort of the forgotten community. Yes. Uh, so I was just wondering. Yeah, no, that changed. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, oh, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess if the name rings a bell, I probably did that at some, at some point. But um, yeah, thank you for that. Any other questions? Any more questions for Michael? All right. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank, thank you, you so for letting me see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, that's great. It's always good to hear. From um, from all our different fantastic venues, I'm sure we have a great time. Okay, so am I in the in position? All right, we're good with sound. You all can hear me back there. All right. So um, what does? Oh, I have to talk, I have to, talk to you guys. Sorry. It's been a long day. All right. So first of all, I want to thank Cindy, who's not here, and Tony for the wonderful, wonderful networking happy hour that we had yesterday. It was fabulous. It was so much fun. When, when you do these really, you know, make a little extra effort to come out. It's just a lot of fun to be with everybody in just a very casual, fun um, location. We were at Parm down on Vesey Street, right near, right near the, um, Monroe Creek. So it's super convenient for me, but it's also a really good place to bring your guests. And their happy hour was great. And it wasn't too crowded. So if you have you know, if you have a group of guests, if you have, especially if you have, you know, you know, of course, an adult guest to, to take somewhere, that's what I think is a really good option. I, I had a really nice time. Good food, good drink, and of course, the best company. So that was fun. So thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Tony, for doing that. Um, and I also want to congrat congratulate everyone on the fantastic fan tours. I see photos all the time of these wonderful fan tours, which are always fun, you know, darn full-time job that doesn't let me go on all the time. Of course I want to go on to because they all look so wonderful. I know Slava gave one, I know Mel gave one. So thank you all. And I know the education committee will be speaking about all the wonderful fans we have. But jumping on to that, when it comes to fan tours, well, I think all of us on the board would have to say, we're just like, guys, what the heck is going on? Don't forget you've got a tour, all right? We're having too many no-shows and that doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. These are the best tours that you could go on. So don't miss it. And if you do have to miss it for any kind of reason, just cancel. Now the tour cancellation is 48 hours before the tour, okay? 
the 48 hours before the tour, the two days before the tour. So I, I booked myself right away to do the summit at one Vanderbilt. I don't know what my, my schedule is yet. I keep checking to see when I'll get my work schedule to know whether I can do it or not. But as soon as I know whether I can do it or not, if I can't, I'm just going to cancel. I just go onto the, um, the, onto the website. A little bit, it's a little disturbing. Not a GANIC member trying to get into the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see the doors open? Yeah. All right. So, so I've, I've already planned out if I cannot make it, I know no ahead of time I'll cancel. You won't be able to cancel under 48 hours from it. And if you're going to be emailing, you know, I'll get these emails saying, hi, I can't make the spam tour. It's like, well, if you didn't cancel, you're just going to have to get um, pay the, um, the fine, the fee for that. And we don't like getting those fees. We really, really don't like getting those fees. And it seems like we're the bad guys, but we're not. It's, it's try to be a deterrent so you guys don't miss the fam. Now, sometimes something comes up and you just miss it. And you know, most people are very gracious. They're like, it came up, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it. And so the, you know, you have canceled the tour. Um, you canceled your spot on the tour. But one of the reasons we like ask for the two day Ahead of two days ahead of time is because if there's a wait list and a lot of these tours have wait lists, you need to tell the next person on the wait list and give them a little bit of buffer time so they can make their plans, so they can change their plans, so they can uh, they can attend it as well. Now the addresses and the locations are very carefully listed. All right, if you're not sure where it is, do a little due diligence. You're a tour guide, you better know the city well because. <laughs> You're getting lost, that's not a good sign. <laughs> so um, yeah, you wanna check where it is. The address is a part of the form. When we have people make a fam tour, they have to give the address. They have to give a starting location and an ending location. So sometimes it's exact street address, sometimes it's the street and the avenue corner, but there is an address. Or sometimes it's a major location, okay? Please don't confuse the Met and the Met. I know they're two Mets, but okay, don't confuse that. I'll leave that there. Um, of course, tip your guides, right? You always want to tip your guides. Um, but also, it's, it's uh, like the like these meetings, like the happy hours. It's a fun way to get to know other guides. Now, if you are thinking of doing a fam tour, do it. Don't think about it. Just do it. Okay. You can go onto the website. Go onto the website. You log in to the Gannick website. You go under the there's a gray members box. All right, you go into the announcements and the documents and you'll see right there, there's a form, there's a link to fill out to propose your own FAM tour. Now, if you're a newbie guide, okay, and you're just, you know, getting your feet wet and you're figuring out what to do and you've got this tour that you've been working on and you've never really tried it with people and you're really nervous about it, just, you know, just jump right in and do it as a Gannick FAM. Everyone here, these are your peers. We're you know, we can seem a little curmudgeonly, but everybody's super friendly and you'll get all the feedback. I like to say you get all the feedback you didn't know you wanted because you will get all the details. You will hear the extra stories. You'll, somebody will pull you aside afterwards and say, you know, when you said this and this, I think you meant that and that, or say, you know, next time try going around the corner this way because it'll be smoother transition or, you know, just practice working with your group. It's hard being a guide for guides because we all know way too much but you will get the best feedback. You really will, because you're getting it from the people who really know what's going on, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, with that, I really don't have anything else to say. I'm sorry that, you know, Jeremy and I get a little preachy and we're always lecturing and saying, guys, you know, come on with the fam. But it's not rocket science. We've gone over this a gajillion times. So you all know the drill. And so we really, I don't think, hopefully we're not gonna be repeating again until you know, maybe in the winter or uh, spring when some but not now you know you guys should you should know you should know how it works okay so you should all be set with that um then last but not least happy pride everyone i hope you all have a wonderful wonderful month i love love being here this is such um, a great space i still haven't run down to use the loo to check it out um, so i'm going to do that in a little bit but um, we're just going to keep on going with our meeting so i'm going to ask bob to come up and to introduce this evening's speaker so thank you everyone so, welcome everyone. I have the honor tonight of introducing our guest speaker, who is Yu Ryan, who is a writer, historian, and curator in New York City. 
His first book, When Brooklyn Was Queer, was called The Boisterous Motley New History, an entertaining and insightful chronicle by the New York Times, who made it an editor's pick in 2019. On the agenda is a whole group of some of the many awards he's won, and he's asked me not to read them. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go into that his current project, entitled The Women's House of Detention, is a queer history of the Women's House of Detention in Greenwich Village. It is the story of one building, the people it caged, the neighborhood it changed, and the resistance it inspired. So please welcome Amy Ryan. Thank you all for having me here. Am I standing in the right spot approximately? Perfect. Okay, good. Just making sure. Uh, it's a real honor to be here as a New York City resident, a longtime New York City resident. I go on many, many, many tours. It's one of my favorite things to do with my partners, my family when they come to visit. So all of you are kind of heroes to me. So it's very exciting to be joining you today. Uh, and also because you are the people who share these histories that are so important. And that I think for many people, they may never want to read my book. I understand that. Nonfiction is not for everyone, uh, but the history in it is, and the stories in it are, and those stories get transmitted to so many more people through all of you. So being able to share this with you is like multiplying the work that I do hundreds of times, thousands of times, and that means so much. My first book, as I mentioned, is called When Brooklyn Was Queer. Uh, it might sound like a, an encyclopedia of queer people in Brooklyn's history, but it's not quite. It's actually a look at the development of queer community in Brooklyn's history from the 1850s up to the Stonewall Rebellion in 1969. It goes a little bit past that, but it's a real close look at the waterfront communities that nurtured queer life and how it developed in Coney Island and Red Hook and downtown Brooklyn and Brooklyn Navy Yard. It goes from 1850 with Walt Whitman, like I said, all the way up to the Stonewall Rebellion, has a ton of different stories and different areas of the city that it covers. My new book, The Women's House of Detention, just came out a couple of weeks ago, and it's a much sort of narrower book in a way. It covers the mid-20th century, so it hones in really closely on the period in which the prison existed. Uh, I don't know if all of you know, the prison was not very far from here. Uh, are folks familiar with the Jefferson Market Library, the clock tower? Yeah. Yes. So that was the courthouse. And the garden that was next to it was the prison. From 1929, when they began building it, to 1974, when it was finally torn down and replaced by the garden. Uh, it had an outsized presence in the neighborhood. And in a second, I'm going to read a couple of different excerpts from the book to kind of lead into how it was developed and how it came to be here. But first I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the prison itself. It was a 12 story maximum security facility. So it was built to hold about 400 people at a time and often it held up to 800 people at a time. Everyone in the neighborhood and everyone who visited called it, called it a landmark. It was a center of the community, a place for people to meet, for people to call up and down to women who were incarcerated and for folks in the queer community to meet each other because in the prison, you often did not get the chance to exchange information, to talk to people that you saw, but you knew there were other queer people there. Today, about 40% of folks incarcerated in women's prisons identify as LGBTQ, 40%. It is a crisis of incarceration that we never talk about. Historically, it was even higher. At certain points in the 1960s, uh, sociologists and incarcerated women estimated that about 70 to 75 percent of the folks incarcerated in the house of detention were queer. There's a lot of reasons for that, and I go into them in the book uh, pretty, pretty deeply. But for right now, what I'm going to do is read three small sections from the book. A bit from the introduction, which lays out kind of the bigger stakes of the book. Then we'll go into 1910 which is when an institution called the Women's Court opened here in Greenwich Village. It's very important, kind of the prehistory of the House of Detention. Because the Women's Court was here, the House of Detention was put here. And then, so we'll jump ahead from 1910 to 1929, with the start of construction of the House of D. I don't normally read these sections of the book to folks, uh, but I think all y'all will appreciate them in a way that most audiences don't. So thank you for giving me a chance to do something a little new. So this is the introduction called J. Tool Marks the Land. 
The Jefferson Market Garden in Greenwich Village is one of the loveliest places I can't stand. <laughs> Flowering season seems to last longer there than the rest of the city. The low-rise nature of the surrounding buildings allows precious sun to warm the ground for Lenten roses in the first weeks of March, and it keeps the garden inviting until the last camellias drop their petals in November. The only potential reminder of the spot's 150-year history as a prison is a high steel fence, which these days keeps the unwanted riffraff out rather than in. I used to love this garden. I'd sit by the koi pond, do interviews on my cell phone, and think what a beautiful oasis it was. What a gift the village had given the city. Now, I can't look at it without hearing Jay Poole's voice describing the brutal physicals that doctors inflicted upon her there when the garden was a prison called the Women's House of the Century. When I go into the garden, I'm always brought back to the one time. It, it, it happened many, many times, but this one stands out. He's telling me to get on the table, put my feet in the stirrups and this and that, and it felt like his whole arm went in there, you know? And they checked everywhere. Every hole you had, that's where they went. And then he was like, all right, get up, off the table, hurry up. We got to bring the next one in. Hurry up? I, I couldn't move. The pain was so bad. I, I don't know what he did up in there, but it was so bad. When I looked down, I was covered in blood and they didn't do nothing. Today, it's hard to imagine that a prison once gra graced the rarefied streets of Greenwich Village, one of New York City's most picturesque and unaffordable neighborhoods. But for almost as long as there has been a Greenwich Village, which is to say almost as long as there has been a United States, detention centers have been an integral part of the village's life. The last of them, the Women's House of Detention, stood from 1929 to 1974. It was one of the village's most famous landmarks, a meeting place for locals and a must-see site for adventurous tourists. And for tens of thousands of arrested women and transmasculine people from every corner of the city, the House of D was a nexus, drawing the threads of their lives together in its dark and fearsome cells. Some were imprisoned there once for as little as a day, Others were turned off and were held for years at a time. For decades, upon their release, these women navigated the streets of Greenwich Village, ate in its auto masks and diners, caroused in the bars that would let them in, lived in nearby tenements, slept rough in the parks, visited friends and loved ones on trial or in detention, worked what jobs would hire them, attended court-mandated health screenings and probation meetings, and in a million one other ways, they made the village their own. Now, Aside from a small plaque on the garden's fence, they have been almost entirely forgotten. Almost. The slim few who have fought to preserve the memory of the House of D are mostly working class lesbian and bisexual women and transmasculine folk, the people most likely to fall into its clutches and least likely to have other landmarks to call their own. Jay Toole first ended up in the orbit of the House of D when she was 13 in 1960. Some friends had just given her the haircut every cool boy wanted. A tight fade flat top, just like Mickey Mantle and Steve McQueen. <laughs> that was the final straw for her father. A violent, sexually abusive man who ruled their Bronx home with his fist. That night he threw her out and Jay lived among the queer kids on the streets of Greenwich Village for the next 25 years. At the age when most of her peers started high school, Jay started heroin. In 1964, she drove, stole a taxi to drive her girlfriend to California, but they only made it as far as Texas before they got caught. And Jay was sentenced to her first bid in the House of D. Quote, a lot of us called it the playground. A lot of us called it a prison. I called it both, Jay told historians in 2016, depending on what I was arrested for and how much I got. For Jay, the prison was complicated. Dangerous, vile, violent, dirty, cruel, but also a place where she met other queer people and one of the centers of her queer community. She and the other butches would hang out in the shadow of the prison at Wayland's Drugstore on 6th Avenue, where they could watch the tide of arrested women flow in and out of the prison's high stone walls. <laughs> Most of the people she met in prison are gone now, dead or just disappeared. But Jay keeps their memories alive. 
Since the early 2000s, she's organized queer tours of the West Village to share the queer history of the House of D because, quote, young people don't know about it. The landmark is gone, but she marks the land, exposing the grim roots beneath the garden's manicured path. And make no mistake, the House of D was a queer landmark. In truth, all prisons are, especially ones intended for women. Today, approximately 40% of the of people incarcerated in women's detention facilities are part of the broad LGBTQ spectrum, compared to about 3.5% of the general population. That's based on in-person interviews with over 100,000 currently detained people. And researchers only identified someone as a sexual minority if they themselves identified that way, or if they had sexual relationships with people of the same sex before being incarcerated. We live now in the age of mass incarceration. If we extrapolate those findings to the nearly quarter of a million women who are currently incarcerated in America, at least 100,000 are queer. And that's after decades of LGBTQ, feminist, anti-racist, and anti-prison activism, which has supposedly made our criminal legal system more fair. During the years the House of D was active, which spanned the single most homophobic period in American history, the percentage of queer people it kept in cage was almost certainly higher. But how much so, we'll never know for sure. But the records of the House of D show that queer women and trans masculine people were arrested for such crimes as smoking, wearing pants, accepting a ride at night from a man, being homeless, attempting suicide, sending the definition of the word lesbian through the mail, associating with, quote, idle or vicious personages, but also forgery, petty larceny, murder, waywardism, vagrancy, alcoholism, drug addiction, rape, stealing rare books, disobedience to their parents, and lesbianism itself. Yet the impacts of queer people on prison history and the impacts of prisons on queer history are rarely explored. And even when they are, the focus is mostly on men. But the House of D, perhaps more than any other prison, had an outsized role in queer life. It sat at the very end of Christopher Street, the block whose name is a global byword for queerness. You could see the Stonewall Inn from the prison's high, small windows. And during the Stonewall uprising, those on the inside held a riot all their own setting fire to their belongings and tossing them out the windows while screaming, gay rights, gay rights, gay rights. Yet still in 2016, the New York Times would refer to the protest as being all gay men and only grudgingly issue a correction stating that there was, quote, at least one lesbian involved. <laughs> one, that's all you get, one. Jay Toole, who was a Stonewall veteran herself, could have told them that anyone had bothered to ask. The House of D helped make Greenwich Village queer, and the village, in return, helped define queerness for America. So I'm going to pause there from the introduction. That kind of sets some of the global stakes for what happens in the rest of the book and why the prison itself is so important. But I want to jump ahead to how we got to this moment. <clears throat> so what you need to know for this next section is that in 1907, New York created something called the Night Court. The Night Court was a nighttime court, as the name suggests, which was created because up until that point, if you were arrested at night, you were taken to the station house, the local precinct for the police, where you were an easy game for extortion. The way it worked was this. The cops would pick you up on a trumped up charge. They would bring you to the station house at night where you were trapped. If you wanted to avoid spending the night in the station house, you had to be bailed or bonded out. So the cops would let certain bail bondsmen in. Those bail bondsmen would give you the money to bond out for a certain non-refundable portion, five to 50%. The cops would take their cut. The woman who was arrested would leave the prison. The bail bondsmen would take the rest of the money. The cops would drop the charges. Now the bail bondsmen didn't have to worry about whether that person was going to arrive back at their court date in order to get their money back. And so it became a revolving door for the New York City police to make money largely off of arrested women. 
the night court was attempted as a solution to that. And right there, Penn Greenwich Village, that garden was the start of the night court. But by 1910, they realized there were a lot of problems with the night court. That in fact, it had not fixed any of the situation. It had merely moved all of this extortion down to Greenwich Village. And on top of that, they had discovered that the night court was almost predominantly focused on women who were arrested as sex workers. So in 1910, something called the Page Act was passed. This created a specific court for women arrested at night called the Women's Court here down in Greenwich Village. And it mandated that near that court, there be a prison for women to be held. Well, a jail actually was what was mandated for women to be held while they were on trial. So we're in 1910 now. <clears throat> Despite its name, the Women's Court was not a court for all arrested women or even for all women arrested at night. Instead, it was dedicated to only two kinds of offenses, prostitution and intoxication, and eventually shoplifting. In the eyes of the court, however, the police and most respectable citizens, any disreputable woman was considered an opportunity for prostitution to occur, regardless of whether she ever actually exchanged sex for money. In 1916, this was codified in New York State legal president, precedent, thanks to a case known as People X. Rel. Miller v. Brockman. In his decision, the presiding magistrate wrote that, quote, prostitution is defined as the common lewdness of women. In discussing this decision, another magistrate clarified, quote, the element of hire or money does not appear to be essential. In 1921, it was ruled that men who hire sex workers cannot be charged under prostitution statutes because the crime lay in the offer of sex, not in the paying for it. Finally, in 1936, another court found, quote, a male person cannot be convicted of being a vagrant prostitute. Thereby, they had completed the illogical syllogism. In the eyes of New York City, all prostitutes were women, and all lewd women were prostitutes. In truth, the women's court was a court for women who were considered improperly feminine, women accused of crimes that would rarely, if ever, have put them in front of a judge in an earlier age, or if they were men. And overwhelmingly, regardless of the specifics of their cases, they were charged as sex workers. Magistrate Anna Cross was one of the presiding folks in the women's court. She also would go on to be a head of the Department of Correction in New York City. She's a really fascinating figure. She wrote after the women's court had been open for two years, quote, no judicial institution has done more to destroy the public confidence in the, integ in the integrity of the judiciary, the police, and of our laws than the women's court. Uh, the Women's Court would remain active in Greenwich Village through World War II and in New York City up through the 50s. But from this point on, thousands of women who were unable or unwilling to obey the dictates of proper femininity were brought to Greenwich Village every single year. At the exact same time, the village suddenly developed a reputation as a bohemian destination, rife with sexual freedom and illicit entertainments. And this was no coincidence. The area already had pockets of bohemians and artists, stretching as far back as 1850, when Walt Whitman caroused in a bar called Fats. But it wasn't until the women's court opened that the neighborhood as a whole gained a reputation as a bohemian nightlife destination. According to Stepping Out, New York, nightlife, <clears throat> New York Nightlife and the Transformation of American Culture, by the 1920s, the village, quote, had become a tourist area, a playground where uptowners could indulge in wilder forms of sensuality where conventional whites could see lesbians and homosexuals on the streets. The book Steppin' Out pegs this increase to 1917, when cafe culture took off. But it fails to mention that the women's court had already been a slumming destination for thrill seekers for a decade at that point. By 1912, one woman lawyer wrote that the court was frequented qu by, quote, a shifting but almost always present group of fashionable men and women who drop in after theater or dinner as they would perhaps to a vaudeville show. This was a feature of the system, not a bug. Although the officials involved in the women's court did not intend their end audiences to get quite so much entertainment out of their work, they intentionally set up a system that would publicly humiliate arrested women. As the court's first probation officer later wrote, quote, 
more important than granting immediate trial to offenders and freeing them from the evil of professional bondsmen has been the service of the night court in showing the public a long procession of girls bound to a life of prostitution. So the guides, the tours that you will be giving are based off of this history that was in itself created as a tourist attraction to educate other people about the terrible lives that these women lived. And that tourist attraction is what created Greenwich Village as a tourist attraction in the 1920s for people who wanted to go slumming. This is a, a quote from 1918 from the New York Tribune. Chinatown or the night court, what shall it be? Has been a usual after dinner question on the part of aristocratic slummers or diners in uptown restaurants or Greenwich Village. Motors have stood for hours outside of Jefferson Market Courthouse while the occupants in the evening dress have watched the tragic procession of women in turn defiant, sullen, whimpering, pass before the magistrate for sentence. Gray-haired women with shifty eyes and bold-faced little girls of 16 stand before the judge while their offense is discussed in the presence of unsympathetic and sensation-speaking spectators. Uh, in fact, it's even worse than that. As I'll explain later in the book, in the earliest portion of the time when the night court was here, if you were an arrested woman and you were suspected of being a sex worker, you were immediately taken into a separate partitioned off room, still sort of in view of the audience, where on one side you were fingerprinted and on the other side you were given one of those brutal dehumanizing examinations that Jay Toole talked about, while an audience could hear because it was intended to humiliate these people. So that's 1910. For the next two decades, uh, the House of Detention is intended to open up, right? The a jail needs to be near the women's courts so that women have a place to stay when they are on trial. Instead, the city does a terrible job at this. They move them all around. They're out on different islands. They're in different facilities. Um, but as World War II uh, kind of starts to be on the horizon, the beginning of fascism, we're uh, the early 1930s. Um, a women's house of detention in New York City seemed to be the city's answer, a place that could hold a large number of women in a denser, more vertical, and less costly arrangement, while still, in theory, providing the same redemptive value as a reformatory, which were much larger campuses for arrested women that were generally held outside the city. In 1914, the city had actually begun to work on a site on West 30th Street, but with the encroachment of World War I, that idea was abandoned because they needed the money for other things. By the mid-1920s, that site no longer seemed viable for the prison, and instead, the city focused on 10 Greenwich Avenue. Primarily, this was because the neighborhood was still disreputable, thanks to the night court. The institutions that appeared to serve those arrested by the courts in the village were noted as, quote, the home of pansies and lesbians and dives of all sort featured this type according to the pioneering sociologist Carolyn Ware, who spent the entirety of the 1920s studying the neighborhood. Her book, Greenwich Village, is an incredible resource for anyone interested in the history of this neighborhood. Most of the bars that Ware talked about are not what we today would think of as gay bars. Rather, they're bars that catered to the hip and happening, for whom homosexuality was suddenly briefly hot. As Ware described the scene in one basement bar, Joe's, quote, by 1930, promiscuity was tame and homosexuality had become the expected thing. One girl who came nightly to the place was the joke because she was so, trying so hard to be a lesbian. But when she got drunk, she forgot and let the men dance with her. To lend a touch of intellectuality and to give people a sense of activity, the proprietor set aside two nights each week for discussions and performances by regular patrons. These evenings, however, did not interrupt the group's major preoccupations for the subjects chosen for discussions were such things as, quote, the social position of gigolos and, quote, what is sex appeal. On the latter subject, the views of the lesbians present were especially called for. Throughout this study, Ware continually noticed the distinct and unique lesbian presence in the village. Of the many bars she examined, only four catered primarily to locals, one of which had, quote, a lesbian reputation and used some local girls as hostesses and attended and attracted others as patrons. Even other areas of the city that had businesses that served queer men, Coney Island and Sand Street in Brooklyn, Times Square and Harlem in Manhattan, 
did not yet have public institutions for queer women. For these women, the village was unique. Moreover, many village residents had their own direct experiences with the criminal legal system, making the presence of a prison not so onerous in their minds. In fact, for some, the idea that their arrested loved ones would be nearby was a positive, not a negative. Incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people were understood as part of the neighborhood, as stakeholders in a world that they were all co-creating, not as interlopers who had been inflicted upon the proper owners of the area. One of the great tricks of mass incarceration, and perhaps, in fact, a necessary step for it to exist at all, was the removal of incarcerated people from the bounds of civic life, physically and spiritually. Over the course of the 20th century, they would go from people to be helped to problems to be solved. In the late 20s, the village went through successive waves of home remodeling, and the villagers, who were kind of the first wave of gentrifiers that Carolyn Ware identified in her study, quote, became a direct danger to those local people who decided to remain in the neighborhood. The villagers fought the placement of the nearby House of D, but they were few and not well organized in the 1930s, or 1920s. In 1928, excavations for a new subway line, today's ACE trains, created serious cracks in the foundations of the Jefferson Market prison, forcing the city to make preparations for an immediate evacuation. This seems to have been the deciding factor, as Jefferson Market would now have to be undergo major structural renovations no matter what, Mayor Jimmy Walker finally pulled the trigger and proclaimed it the site for the now 18 year delayed Women's House of Detention. For the first new penal institution built in New York in 35 years, the city planned to go all out. According to a 1929 annual report of the Department of Corrections, the Women's House of Detention would feature a massive hospital covering several floors with state of the art medical equipment and extensive psychological services. Most importantly, in the eyes of the city, there would be enough space to ensure complete segregation of the imprisoned population at all times. The hospital would function independently from the prison, and incarcerated people would be separated by age, type of case, health status, drug use, arrest history, etc., etc., etc. All told, the initial concept of the Women's House of Detention was a triumph for progressive reformers of the day. But those were summer plans made while the 20s were roaring. All prisons naturally reform back, all prison reforms naturally sink back to a baseline close to, or worse than, what came before. Imagine what would happen to a prison opened amid the worst depression our country had ever known, followed immediately by a world war. Is it any wonder that the House of D would come to be known as Skyscaper Alcatraz, the shame of the city, or simply the hellhole? So, Thank you. That kind of lays out the stakes and how the prison came to be in this neighborhood. What the rest of the book does is follow the lives of folks who were incarcerated there to talk about how it affected them, how it took women from every corner of the city, every borough, and many from outside the city, and brought them together in Greenwich Village during the most homophobic period in American history, during the late 40s, the 1950s, and the early 1960s, at a time when gay bars were being raided in all five boroughs, when people were being arrested on the streets, when the police were even raiding private homes and Broadway theaters for obscenity, they could not shut down the House of Detention because they were the ones bringing queer women there. And that is what makes it absolutely unique, both for the history of queer people and for the history of Greenwich Village. I'm gonna stop talking now. I know that was a lot from me, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might've had either about what I've read already or about anything else. It can be about my other book, it can be about history generally, yes. Oh, that's the best question. I like you. Uh, so there is, as I think you know from the tour that you did earlier, a Bureau of General Services Queer Division bookstore here. They have copies of the book. Uh, they are wonderful. I highly recommend buying from them if you're able to. They're having an event tonight, so I believe they will be open for a little while longer. But it's also available pretty much anywhere you could think to buy a book, and in every format. It's audio. It's ebook. There's a hardcover. With any luck, if we sell well enough, there will be a paperback down the line. Uh, if you have to buy it from a large retailer place like Amazon, I do know that it is much cheaper there than anywhere else. So make with that information what you will. Thank you. So 
I think we saw one, two, three questions over here. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that spot, 10 Greenwich Avenue, has been home to detention facilities since the early 1800s. When the New York City's watch was opened, uh, the, the, the first sort of like police force in the city that was only at night, they were centered there. And then when the first police force was opened up in New York, which I believe is the late 1800s, I always get the exact time wrong, uh, there were three districts created. The second district was headquartered at 10 Greenwich Street. Uh, that courthouse that is still there now, the library, there was an older detention facility, a, a jail that was of the same style. That building, the foundation was cracked badly while they were digging out what would eventually become the ACE. And that's what they tore down in order to make way for the prison that then became the House of Blues. I am not, I am not, unfortunately, but we have a great reader. She is really wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I like doing readings and I'm doing many more readings. If you like listening to me, uh, you can hear me all around the city. And the first book, uh, When Brooklyn Was Queer, I did do the audio book for, so you can hear me for about 12 hours if you want. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I often joke, I get asked to do tours of Brooklyn and I say it's gonna be a tour of on-ramps and parking garages. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's like Robert Moses's thumbprint on every place I would go. Uh, and that is unfortunately the truth. It's not just queer communities, but particularly economically disadvantaged communities here in New York over and over again. Urban renewal runs ramshod, rough, ramshackle, that's the one I wanted, right through those communities and destroys the buildings and the homes that they once had. So I do a lot of work when I'm going to talk to people about these histories, I will do a lot of things like I will get as many photos as I can in advance so that after they've talked to me for a little while, I can show them the photo and say, hey, do you remember this by any chance? I'll bring a map and I'll say, you know, you told me you went to this bar and you told me about the house of detention. Let's look and find the route that you took. And maybe that'll remember, that'll make you remember some things. I find a lot of audio files. The House of D is in all different kinds of mid-century music, weirdly enough. Uh, Jerry Herman, the, who wrote uh, Hello Dolly, wrote a review in 1959 that featured a song called Save the Village, which is all about the House of D. Uh, the new show, or the old show that is returning to Broadway this year, Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural De Death by Melvin Van Peebles, has a song called Tenth in Greenwich, which is all about the house of detention. So I'll play those songs for people, and I'll use them when I'm talking to folks, too. When I'm doing, uh, I, I, do, I don't do tours, but I do presentations, and I'll use those uh, musical cues, uh, any footage that I can find to try and just revoke for re-invoke for people what has been forgotten, what has been lost. Uh, but also, I find that there's something really powerful about that to be able to say to people, there was a 12-story prison here 50 years ago, not that long ago. In living memory, it was here. Can you imagine how much this city has changed in 400 years? Can you imagine how much this city is going to change? I mean, that's the thing I love about history, right? Is that we can't see the future, but by knowing how different things were 100 years ago, we know how different they can be 100 years from now. And that's what I hope people walk away from with my book.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting. So the popular story uh, that you're referencing goes like this, that in the bar that night, there was a person who may have been a drag king, a trans man, a butch lesbian, a stud, someone who was assigned female at birth, but was generally perceived as masculine of center, who was arrested and brought out to the paddy wagon while being dragged into the paddy wagon. She got out of it uh, and then got grabbed by the police again, at which point she yelled to the crowd, why don't you do something? I have met several people who have told me they were that woman. Uh, <laughs> make of that also what you will. Stormy Lov De Lavery, I can never pronounce her last name. Who, could you please pronounce it again? De Lavalle, thank you, I can never get it right. Stormy De Lavalle is also often thought of. It has at times, she said in interviews that that was her. At times she also said it was not her. Uh, complicated histories, right? What we do know is that these folks were there. Uh, like I said, we know that queer women rioted in the prison during the Stonewall riots. I, in fact, was just looking at files from the House of Detention this morning to find out more about them. Uh, but yes, arrested folks who were masked in the center were definitely part of this protest. On the first night of Stonewall, on the second night of Stonewall, on the third night of Stonewall, which is commonly thought of as the most uh, violent night of Stonewall, the fourth night, there was no fifth night, and then again on the sixth night, right? Because Stonewall is not simply what happened in the bar during the hour around 1.30 a.m. on June 28th, 1969. It's a much bigger event, but you're right. That story is essential and important to remember. Uh, and yes, they were going to take that person merely a block away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll happily do that. Yeah, I will. Yep, yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes, the mamas and papas refers to that clock before it was fixed by the rent of, uh, yeah, yeah. So if you, what is the actual title of that song? Young Girls Are Going to the Canyon? That, yeah, whatever that song is, also about Greenwich Village. Thank you. <laughs> David Duchovny and Erica Badu, yes. really trying to get both of them to read my book, but so far they have not responded to my Instagram messages. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we've got a lot going on. Hmm? Yes. Uh, No, no, not at all. I mean, not even close to just the gay issue. I think that we are living in a time where bodily autonomy for any kind of marginalized group is really under attack. And there are days where I wake up thinking, is this the Weimar Republic, right? Am I one of those people who in five years is going to be saying, why didn't I get out when I could? I think it is urgent that we connect these histories to what is happening today. The 70s, 80s, 90s, yeah. yeah. When I first moved here to New York, I was a clinic escort outside of a clinic in Sunset Park that has since been closed down by protesters. Uh, it's still happening here. Yeah. Yeah, good, good for your daughter.
Thank you, everyone. That was, that was wonderful. Thank you so, so much. That was, that was really, it was, it was great. It was great. I'm, yeah, I'm trying to read a new, different, important book a month, and I'm just like, bing, I found my August book. It's right there. All right, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really, oh, yeah, I'm just like getting all fired up. Um, so great. Thank you very much for that. And so, yeah, everyone, please, you know, that's a great idea. Submit it as a, as a nomination for a standing nonfiction book. Um, let me just grab my agenda. I sort of like it. All right, so we're going to continue with the rest of our meeting. So we do have our um, committee reports. And speaking of of uh, the Apple Awards, we are going to have the awards as our first committee report. Am I visible on this thingy? All right, great. I was glad to see how many people were thinking the same way I was on that. Um, so I have a very short report. I know you're not used to hearing from me at this time of year, uh, but the awards committee is going to get back to its meetings early this year because you know, although obviously our first mission has always been publicity, that's always been important. You know, don't get distracted by the fact that it's award ceremony. You know, the point of it is to get Gannick's name out there. And so publicity and enhancing our reputation is important and it's what we pay our budget for. We still try to offset that budget as much as we can with ticket sales and sponsorships. And that has been where we've always had the least success in an otherwise very successful annual event. So, on June 14th, 6 p.m., we are going to have a cross-committee meeting where members of the awards committee, the public relations committee, and the industry relations committee will all get together. But anyone is welcome to attend this meeting. Do not feel that you have to serve on one of those three committees to attend. We are looking for new inventive, successful ways to promote. We want more people buying tickets. We want more people buying sponsorships. We want more people buying program ad space. And we are looking for help from across Gannick to make that happen. So if you would like to attend the meeting on June 14th, please let me know at awards at Gannick.org. I will submit, you know, the, the head count basically to the board, you know, a few days before the meeting. I'll you know, make it, you know, well, it's 48 hours in a uh, notice. Uh, uh, we're going to do this in person. We're going to do this in person at Gannick's WeWork space. So it's 48 hours enough notice to be able to book that space. Great. So by the evening of the 12th, you know, I will let the board know how many people are attending so they know how big of a room to book. But if you have any ideas on how to improve ticket sales, sponsorship sales, ad space, we want you there. If you don't have any ideas but think you might have some, we want you there at this cross-committee meeting, 6 p.m., June 14th. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt. So June 14th, 6 p.m., the WeWork is downtown. All right, right next to Zuccotti Park. It's 115 Broadway. It's either the fifth or the seventh floor, depending on which um, conference room we get. And it's a nice, comfortable space. Um, we have all our board meetings there. So that's where the WeWork is. So if you can just stop downtown, do it. And in-person meetings, of course, may always make all, all the difference. Okay, so our next up is education. So we actually have Nina here. So here we go. Hi, it's nice to. Uh, yeah. Okay, it's it's nice to be back in person. Uh, I've been really enjoying the meetings on Zoom and and seeing everyone step up. We're sort of like a relay team, the education committee, and uh, you all know uh, Jeremy is now in London, and uh, we have dear Bob here who's juggling a lot of stuff and. Elisa's in Jersey. I mean, she comes in sometimes. And uh, Susan over there. And so I thank and Eileen Roark uh, uh, helping out there. And Minna is upstate. So we're all, uh, and of course, John, John Semler. 
So uh, uh, with just a short report, uh, we have an upcoming FAM tour, How to Stay Safe on duty and off duty with Coleman O'Reilly, and that's June 3rd. And I think there are a couple of places left. It's not totally sold out, so you have a chance to sign up for that. And another one is Discover Brooklyn Subway Secrets and Abandoned Stations with Ryan Real, Ryan Real, I think. And that's July 16th. And we have a webinar coming up, and this one would be interesting for everyone, How to Price Your Tours with Josh Oaks of the Sunshine Tribe, and that's June 16th from 7 to 8.30 p.m., and a special thanks to Kit Garrett for organizing that. So that's a webinar, and uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Industry Relations, Beth Goff, and, and our Education Committee for uh, making the uh, summit, Visit to the Summit, uh, a success. I know it's oversubscribed. Uh, June 8th and June 15th are the remaining days. I think there's a wait list for that. But Bob Gelber, Harvey Davidson, Jeremy Wilcox, Minna Sharp, Beth Goff all brought, th brought that together both. And uh, our next uh, Ed Committee will be Wednesday, June, 5th, June 15th at 6 p.m. Uh, you can join us by Zoom. Uh, and we, I just want to say just recently this week, we, uh, we, I have a thank, we have a thank you index for FAM, so if you missed a FAM, you know the person who gave it, and you can kind of hop on their tour during the year. And uh, but one one FAM that just happened uh, yesterday was Little Ukraine's past and present with Slava Spiegel, and uh, that was wonderful. And maybe Slava will we'll do another one uh, for you. Can look him up, uh, and he gave us all a little you know blue and yellow hearts, and you know we all made contributions to his organization. And if you want to, you want to say what it is? We're out uh, at the end of the meeting. Okay, good. But that, that, that's about it. Um, and, we're and if you want to look up other webinars that we've done, um, it's under resources. And uh, any FAM tours you want to do, you know, as Emma, you know, she's the patron saint of <laughs> the, <laughs> of the <laughs> education. So uh, thank you. Nice to be back. Thank you. Um, does anyone have questions for Nina, though? Does anyone have questions for Nina before she? OK, all right, we're all set. So um, Patrick, if you'd like to come up to speak on behalf of government relations. All right, am I hitting my mark? Tape, we should have taped the floor. And I should know that. <laughs> yeah, me at a wide angle. Great, I probably just got pencil out here. All right, hi everybody, how are you? All right, uh, what are we gonna talk about? First off, I wanna thank everybody who uh, harassed Justin Branham. We really heard that He's got a lot of emails about reintroducing 289A and his people finally decided to respond. And this shout out also goes to GANDIC member, uh, Tony Montione, who let us know about the response. Apparently some of the issue is that he is not exactly the guy as we were led to believe was going to reintroduce this. Yeah, because they haven't really decided who's supposed to reintroduce this. Were you in my, the ply on my wall when I was reading this exchange of emails, AJ? <laughs> so there's a, there's a little bit of backstory. I'm not going to get too involved in city bureaucracy. But this city council's track record so far is abysmal uh, compared to what they have introduced for discussion and what they have passed as compared to previous city councils. Uh, pulling up the numbers that came from state and city NYC, they quite frankly barely got anything out. I did pull up the number and it's not on this copy. Oh, yeah, they only passed two bills so far since they, uh, since they called this session. And they admit to have over a thousand left over from the last session. 
So, oh, and this also is complicated by a rules change about how these bills are going to be reintroduced. So, I'll get something out on our social media in the next day or so, but the targets are now going to be Speaker Adrian Adams, Assistant Speaker Diana Ayala, and just, uh, we're gonna let Justin Brandon go for a little while. We certainly made an impression with him, but since uh, there seems to be some question who's actually going to introduce the bill, we're also gonna put some email information for the council member who is on the uh, Department of the near the City Council's Committee on Consumer and Worker Protection. So we'll have three targets and you'll get that information in the probably the next 48 hours. I'll get that up on our social media. Um, the struggle continues. What can I tell you? But we are making an impression. They know we're here. And I thank everybody who wrote Brandon's office. It did have an effect. Now, on a lighter note, a happier note, uh, the sightseeing guide license wound up on the list of licenses that the city of New York was going to suspend, do away with. We heard about it. We thank Moses uh, Gates for the intel on that. Uh, Jonathan, representing membership, and myself, representing government relations, met with the special advisor to the deputy mayor for economic development and had a marvelous Zoom session with her. It was upbeat, it was positive, and we kind of figured we, kind of, we would have an ally when she said how one of the first things she did when she came to New York was she got on a double-decker bus and had a wonderful time touring the city. And she puts her friends on double-deckers when they come to the city. And Jonathan and I, of course, informed her that that's not fun anymore. And she was like, what? So maybe we're gonna have an ally in, on, in that battle. So we'll see. Anyway, it was a productive meeting after a couple of weeks. You do the follow-up email. We got the follow-up email uh, that she is going to recommend to the powers that be and her associates in the deputy mayor's office for economic development that New York continue to license sightseeing guides. That is her recommendation. It is not etched in stone yet. Lord knows with this mayor, whatever is going to actually happen. But I want to give a shout out to, uh, to Moses Gates for giving us the word, to Jonathan for stepping up, and I'll even take a little applause for acting on our behalf. We got a little good news. We are on a deputy mayor's office radar. That's not bad. So I'll take any questions you might have. Matt. Right now, I'll be the one hurrying up and wait. I will be going to follow up with her again in two weeks. If she hasn't gotten back to us, I will then ask for, do you know when you can going to get back to us? Anybody else? Okay. A side note, not specific to Gannick, but it is government relations. Uh, the Democratic Party really blew it in New York State when they put up the new districting map and the judge threw it out. It was too gerrymandered. Democrats did have an opportunity to submit another map. Did they? No. So a judge in upstate New York popped it off to somebody else. So you're going to see a little chaos with two sets of primaries coming up. I ask everybody to please be aware that your state senator may not be the state senator you had previously. And uh, what's the other category? A state assembly? No, your House of Representatives may also not be the one you thought you had. So Ballotopedia, the Board of Elections, good sources. Uh, if you really get jammed up, write us. I'll try to find out what's happening in your districts. But clearly, what's going on in the United States right now, if you don't get off your ass and vote, we're screwed. We are absolutely screwed on every societal level you can imagine. And this is only a quarter of the outrage my wife has to put up with when I'm watching the news every night. So get out there, find out who the candidates are, understand their positions, 
and please vote. And even more importantly, help somebody else get out to vote. Make one person in your building, in your neighborhood, on your block, the one person who maybe kind of doesn't want to, doesn't care, can't physically do it easily, help them vote. Just one. Just one. Let's make our voices heard. What does not voting mean? New York State is one of those states where you have to have a reason for an absentee ballot. You, do. you have to have a reason for an absentee ballot. That could have changed last year. They were going to drop the reason for an absentee ballot. Just ask for an absentee ballot and you'll get it. Nobody showed up for it except that other party. Guess what? You want an absentee ballot now, you got to come up with one of three reasons. This is New York. Instead of leading the, the right to vote, freedom to vote, we have fallen behind. That's unacceptable. So get a little chauvinistic about it. Rock the vote. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Patrick? Any questions? Yeah. 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 So. Vote, vote, vote. Yeah. Yeah. No, your candidates check check your check everything and vote, vote, vote. Vote for everything. You don't have to vote for dog catcher anymore, but if you did, gotta vote for her or him. Oh exactly. Exactly. All right. <laughs> so our next is industry relations. So Harvey's gonna read on behalf of Beth. Thank you, Madam President. I can't say that industry relations will be as exciting as sexual relations as our earlier speaker talked about, but the, the industry relations committee was, uh, or was responsible for the summit trips and it was organized by Bob Gelber and myself. There was a visit last Wednesday led by Jeremy Wilcox. Next Wednesday, June 8th, a visit will be led by Minna Scharf and the third one will be led by Bob Gelber. This will be on Wednesday, June 15th. The upcoming visits are already filled to capacity, but we're trying to arrange another visit, possibly more than one, another visit, and we'll keep you posted if it's approved. We're waiting to hear back from Davila Media, the publishers of City Guide, about how we can work together. I'm in contact with Davila Media's president, David Miller. Also, I'm planning to meet with a flappish bid later in the month to discuss being a strategic affiliation partner and try to arrange a site inspection. Another sign up affiliate partner, strategic affiliate partner would be uh, in Newark, New Jersey. I spoke with Jennifer Costa, the executive director of Go Elizabeth, a nonprofit destination management and marketing organization. And she said she will be applying to become a strategic affiliation partner. A key reason that there's going to, there's going to be a daily ferry service from Lower Manhattan near the South Street Seaport and, and Wall Street to Elizabeth, New Jersey and there will be connecting transportation to the Newark Liberty International Airport and Jersey Mills Mall. Now the Jersey Mills Mall has no tax on a lot of items. So this will be an important thing for tourists to want to go, go there and buy things. Okay, this could, excuse me? No. <laughs> this could provide guide opportunities for meet and greet and shopping excursions, as well as when the cruise lines continue to use the area for a port. Costa will also request Elizabeth Fast Ferry to become an industry partner. When operational, we should be able to arrange a site inspection and get a speaker for one of our monthly meetings. In addition, Costa is interested in arranging a site inspection for Elizabeth. She also said, if GANIC is a strategic affiliation partner of Go Elizabeth, individual GANIC guides can be eligible for its health insurance plan. So if you have a health insurance that you wanna buy or you're buying on your own, you'll be eligible to buy it if, if you're interested through Go Elizabeth, which could save you some money. So let's see what happens with that. And with that, thank you. Any questions? No, nope. great. Thank you. Nope. Oh, there's your whole IT. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, IT, we um, inadvertently got let off, left off the agenda. And so I'm putting on my IT chair cap here, just to give you a little update. Um, we're working on the refresh of the website and 
Mark uh, was at a really, really productive meeting we had along with AJ and we, we met with Sam in, in person, like in the flesh. Sam Cohen is our, um, our website designer. And I have known Sam, how long have we known Sam? We've worked with Sam forever. I mean, it's probably 15 years more. Anyway, I had, I, had, I had never actually met him in person. I've been working with him for so long. And we had a wonderful meeting. It was really, really productive. We did miss you, Sarah, but we will sure to get you at the next one. And so I just want to give you all uh, some, just some updates, some information about it. So first of all, we know that people grumble about the website. And we hear it, Mark hears it, I hear it, and, you know, people say, oh, you know, well, I don't like the website. And so our next thing is, what don't you like? Well, I just don't like it. Well, what don't you like about it? Well, you know, it's just, you know, and I'm like, no, that's why I'm asking you what you specifically don't like about it. So that's what we're working with. We're going to refresh it. We, it, we know it's dated. We know it's too text heavy. We know the different issues. And so Sam is really open to um, to our ideas and our discussion. And so um, sooner or ra rather than later, we hope to be having some ideas of templates, some ideas of new looks. And then um, so those of you who were at the committee con who signed up to be our sort of beta testers, we're going to be hopefully showing you things in maybe another couple months. Um, but just to, I want you all to know that it's on the way. You know, we are working on this. This is not being put on the back burner. It's never really been on the back burner, but it's always been something that we've wanted to work on. And now we're really um, putting efforts to it and we're going to get something hopefully exciting and interesting and new. A couple of things about the website. This may be a little granular for some of you, um, but it is really, um, it may not have the aesthetics that you like, but it really does a lot. And something that people don't realize with their website, those of you who are in IT do realize, it has an extraordinary amount of functions that are sort of hidden underneath. So while you might not like what it looks like on the outside, it's chugging along really pretty well. Um, but as always, if you have questions or you have comments, or even if you just want to give me some, you know, some, I'll take all the unsolicited um, advice that, um, you know, that you care to give me, but be specific. If there's something you say, well, I don't, you know, I've always had a hard time finding this or finding that. Jot it in an email, send it to it at gannick.org. And we'll put that in with everything. You know, so it'll be a little more grist for our mill, but we are working on it. We are working on it. And, um, you know, sooner or later, rather than later, we'll have something to actually show you all, but um, it's really, it's in the works. So I want to give you an update on that. Any questions about it? Any questions? No? Oh. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you have suggestions, be specific. Really try to be as specific as you can. Tell us what you like and you don't like and why. Right. Yeah. If there's yeah, if there's some function that you can't do or something that you can't find as quickly or as easy as you'd like, let us know and we can add that to our list. It's it's long, but we like to have <laughs> like to have all the information. Yeah. Oh, we do ask that, and we do ask that, and then we'll get some things like well, you know, um, I mean, so for example, like the DC Guild, they have a very slick, um, nice website, and it's beautiful. Um, I don't know what it does on their back end or that kind of stuff it does on the back end. I mean, it, I don't mind. And I don't, and honestly, I don't take any of this personally. I'm just like, all right, I'll, we'll fix it. If we can fix it, we'll try to fix it. Yeah. Well, it looks pretty. Yeah. I mean, it looks pretty. I mean, but that's not, but. No, no, I mean, I'm not, and I don't want to knock our, our compatriots down in DC, but I'm just want to say that, you know, people, there, there's certain looks that, you know, websites and, and, and tech have changed so much. Okay. It's, of course, ours look dated. It is dated, and we know that, we acknowledge it, and we're working on it. Okay. So um, now it's your turn. <laughs> so, Jonathan, we come up to speak for membership. I have an extremely uh, brief report. We have three new provisional members. I don't know if they're in the room. If they are, I uh, would love to have you stand up and wave hello to uh, everybody else. But uh, Michael Stanton, we want to welcome you. Hiram Jacobs and Benedict Charpentier, we want to welcome the three of you. I didn't think they were in the room, but just on the off chance. 
uh, if you are out there watching this later, we all heartily welcome you to the Guides Association of New York City. Thank you. I know. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, we're winding um, down. I know that Anina, you mentioned also Slava. Did you want to come up and speak? Um, yeah. Come on down. Because, yeah, sorry, I felt badly we cut you off after Nina pointed you out. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Slava. Thank you for allowing me to get on. I will be very brief, just a couple of minutes. Uh, yesterday, I did my first FAM uh, tour for Ganic. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, today, my first addressing the uh, membership. So um, I don't know what tomorrow brings. Um, if you, uh, uh, I, I, I get a lot of good comments. If uh, uh, education committee is interested, I may offer this tour uh, maybe a couple months. Uh, and because uh, uh, John Samlock was pushing me uh, gently for years, <laughs> literally to to do this. So thank you. I, I'm glad I did it. Uh, we gathered money for Razum for Ukraine organization, and I thank very much for doing that. We got two hundred forty-seven dollars. I donated them uh, today, and the screenshot is on the Facebook um, Ghanic members uh, page. Thank you. I also list there several ways to uh, help Ukraine if you. Can I will just uh, list them briefly. You can donate, of course. There are links for Razum for Ukraine, which is a New York-based organization uh, founded in 20, 2014. Uh, you can uh, write to your representatives while you still know who they actually are. Uh, there, there is an easy way. There is a website that I, um, uh, the instruction I linked to uh, mention that takes two minutes, uh, really, to um, uh, uh, right to a senator or representative. Um, this is a bit of an unusual call for you, but I think it mostly mute for most. Um, uh, I would like to ask you to deny service to um, residents of Russian Federation who come to New York, because there is a, a movement, widespread movement in Russia to uh, re uh, resist the regime, and that's um, curbing down your economic activity. So it's, it's an easy way to not fuel uh, the war effort if you are in Russia and you can't leave for some reason. So if you, they travel, they don't, they're not participating in that. And that's completely safe. That's not protesting or anything. So please, if you, if you, if you, if you know they're from Russian Federation, I'm not saying they're Russian, of course not. But if you, if you know they're from there, if you, they have a plus seven phone number, uh, don't work with them. Um, we have a store, my wife and I, in the first week of the war, we started a Nazi store and we sell Ukrainian merchandise. And uh, it's uh, sometimes exclusive items. Um, um, we have uh, local street artists like BK Fox and Funcast donating their art exclusively to, 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 to the store. And we sell it in the form of t-shirts and stickers and stuff. And 100% profits go to uh, Razum for Ukraine and coming back alive in UA organization. Yes. Yes, I failed to mention I'm from Ukraine. This, yeah. Yes. Uh, my grandmother, who uh, just turned 84 a couple of days ago, um, is living through the second uh, war in her lifetime. She was a kid during World War II, and she told me she kind of. Uh, she, remem she, she remembers the, the sirens and the, the explosions, and they happen, in, uh, unfortunately, in our city uh, as well, even though we didn't see the fighting that the East um, uh, saw recently. So she can't leave uh, because of her illness, and she's alone there, but she's being helped by friends and uh, neighbors. Um, so yeah, we, we write her every day and we worry, uh, but she's, 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 she's okay. Thank you for asking. Um, what else, what else, what else? The Etsy site, the link is in the uh, Facebook post, but it's uh, called For Ukraine. So it's etsy.com slash shop slash For Ukraine uh, together. F-O-R, F-O-R, Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, please attend protests. That's probably the easiest one. They're usually on Saturdays, uh, and you can... Subscribe to the Instagram for us for Ukraine. The link is also in, in the Facebook post. And they uh, usually in the Tuesday or Wednesday, they post about 
when and what will be the theme of the protest on Saturday. It's usually around 12, uh, 1 or 2 p.m. So it's easy to attend. It's great to have uh, numbers. You can also volunteer for Horizon for Ukraine organization. They have a form you can fill out and uh, they will call you if they need help uh, I don't know, packing medical supplies for shipment uh, to the Polish-Ukrainian bo uh, border. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Yeah, oh, hold on, Sasha, Sasha, hold on. Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And my little plug is so when I do my Gilded Age mansions, I bring my guests into the Ukrainian Institute and they've got the most beautiful exhibitions, um, always lovely objects. And, and the, in the ground level on the lobby, when you go in, in the, what's the study area, they have the beautiful painted eggs and all sorts of wonderful objects there. And um, you can go and you just, they just ask you for a donation. And if you're with, if you're with um, guests who have been on their Gilded Age bender, take them into the building because you can go all the way up and you can see this beautiful, beautiful Gilded Age mansion. We'll do a Gilded Age talk. Um, and that, but that's, that's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. Susan? Oh yeah, yeah. So tours at the Ukrainian Institute. Yeah, it's really, it's really good. I just, yeah, I've been bringing my guests in there um, and everybody buys a pen or makes a donation. Super easy. All right. Anything else? Do we have any more unfinished business or any more new business, Nina? Oh, yes. Yes. So Kevin, yeah. So huge thanks to Kevin Lawrence and to Beth Goff, especially Kevin for getting this wonderful, wonderful speaker. It was just, just fantastic. I think we all agree. It was great. And I think we're all going to go out and buy the book. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, anything else? So Okay, so f okay, so yeah, so the um, the pianos are coming back to twenty eight Liberty Plaza and Joe Path on PBS, John. Second motion to adjourn, seconded by AJ. All right, so we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, coming. Thank you, guys. Have a great rest of your month. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Zoom. <laughs>